Okay, I think we're going to get started. I'm just signaling to the, uh, to the booth above. I think everybody's uh, uh, in your college. Um, I'm glad that you made it uh, in out of the rain, and I'm glad that you're here to speak, to, to listen to me speak on this topic. Um, sad though that it might be, I was considering, this was originally scheduled during the, the time of the, uh, the fires, and I was considering canceling altogether because this is a rather depressing topic on top of a rather cr crisis situation we've been dealing with in terms of our, our city and our county. I mean, almost like I think we should all just kind of get in a circle and hug each other almost. <laughs> Uh, and, and I guess the, uh, the title would be more like, why? <laughs> but but uh, I do think I have some important things to share, and I was encouraged to continue with this presentation. So we rescheduled it for this date, and I'm glad that you're here. Okay, so let's start uh, and dig right in. Here's an outline of my presentation. Um, I will cover three different areas. What does voter turnout tell us about the 2016 election? That's number one. Number two, is there a pattern in the voter turnout that allows for a story to emerge from the data? So number one is gonna be a kind of quantitative analysis, and number two is gonna be more of a qualitative analysis. And then I'm gonna open it up for questions and answers. I'm gonna try to do so, uh, so that there is plenty of time for us uh, to, to have a discussion back and forth. So let's start number one, voter turnout. What does the data tell us? I got tremendous number of emails when, the, when this uh, w was announced across the, um, the, the college to remind everyone that Hillary Clinton did actually win the popular vote. I got about 25 emails. So she won the popular vote by nearly three million votes or 2.1% of the overall vote. This is one of the largest gaps in US history between the popular and the electoral college. You have to go all the way back to about uh, 1886 for that to have, uh, for, for the larger uh, gap t to be between the popular and the electoral college. Just to give us a recent comparison, in two 2000, Al Gore won the popular vote and, and Bush won the uh, electoral college, but he only won by 500,000 votes. So that gives you a kind of scale of the difference. Let's look at voter turnout. 250 million voting age people in the United States. Nearly 20 million people are ineligible to vote because they are non-citizens or live in a state that strips them of voting rights due to felony conviction. I'm gonna return to that uh, point in just one minute and really emphasize it. So that gives us 230 million eligible voters, but only 136 million votes were cast in 2016. So let's do this in a math equation. 250 million minus 20 million ineligible gives us the 230. The 136 votes cast, what does that leave us with? 94 million people that did not vote in the 2016 election. 94 million eligible voters, and I'm, I'm getting the source from the, the United States Election Project. The website is right there for those of you that like to copy this down. It's a phenomenal data analysis project run out of the University of Florida. So 94 million eligible voters. I think in this aftermath of this election, particularly from a lot of the liberal media, we've heard everything but that statistic, right? We've heard about Russian meddling. We've heard about James Comey. We've heard about um, all kinds of variety of different, or if you're a conservative-minded person, you've, you've heard a lot of probably about voter fraud, about undocumented people voting, all of these different things, but we have not focused in on this number. And this is the number which I will call the enthusiasm gap. And I'm gonna return to that concept in just a minute, the enthusiasm gap. But it is really this number that I wish for us to think about, and if you walk away with anything from this presentation today, I want you to have that number in your head, because we as a college, uh, we as faculty, we have staff, we have a dramatic ability to impact that for the upcoming election, and especially you as students. It is well understood that it is young voters and it is poor voters that are the least likely to vote, uh, which, and we are in a unique place in a community college that serves that audience in, in a, in a really rather dramatic way to try to impact that number of 94 million people that did not vote in the 2016 election. I'm gonna keep repeating it. <laughs> just so that we understand it. Okay. How does this present itself on a historical graph? Uh, the United States has the lowest voter turnout of any industrialized country in the world. In fact, many industrialized countries, such as Germany, require you to vote. You can't get out of voting. We never seem to break the, uh, early, the, the um, 
low 60s threshold uh, in terms of voter turnout. So if we're looking, you know, that's historically, even at the highest voter turnout in the last 50 years, which was the, the, Obama, the first Obama election, this number is a little bit low because the data was released on November 10th when not all the absentee ballots and other things were counted. This went up to 60%. So is is equal to the 2012 election. This statistic, however, get my students that are in a kind of panic due to feeling that they're in the crosshairs of uh, this rising conservative movement that elected Trump. I, this gives them a lot of comfort when I remind them, actually a very small group of people elected this president, right? So this is the numbers as reflected. So it's, it's a slight, so Hillary Clinton's numbers went up a little bit from this and Trump's numbers went down a little bit from this. But if you factor in the 20 million people who are ineligible to vote, mainly due to felony conviction, we're talking about 20, 21% of the population that actually elected Trump. So in your, if you're in your mind feeling this overwhelming sense of being targeted by this absolute majority of voters in the country that voted for this conservative agenda, you're wrong, right? The voter turnout is such um, that actually a rather slim margin of people uh, elected the current president. But I should say that that's not an unusual pattern, right? So I, I, gave, I wanted to give some historical data as well, okay? Let's move to part two. Is there a pattern in the data that we, can, we could start to suss out? Let me give a map. These states right here represent states that uh, voted for Obama in 2012 and voted for Trump in 2016. These are what are, th this area of the country is generally referred to as uh, battleground states or swing states. I have an understanding of these states both from uh, the data that I've looked at uh, and the research that I've looked at, but I actually went to graduate school in Ohio. And I went uh, specifically in Northwest Ohio, which is a swing county. I worked both Obama campaigns in 2008 and 2012, so I have some personal experience and also academic experience in this. So it is really in my talk today, I'm gonna focus in on these states, and why am I gonna do that? These are battleground states. Trump won the Electoral College by winning three key battleground states by a combined vote total of, wait for it, wait for it, 77,000 votes, right? So in three states, he won the Electoral College that pushed him over the, uh, the, the necessary Electoral College votes to get elected president by only 77,000 votes. How does that break down? That is 1 20th of 1% of the overall vote. Okay, 77,000 divided by 134 million is 1 20th of 1% of the overall vote is how this election was decided. So this is, I'm trying to get to that how question. Uh, that's 44,000 votes in Pennsylvania, that's 22,000 votes in Wisconsin, and that's 10,000 votes in Michigan. This is what I want you to pay attention to. While those numbers are pretty alarming, and it gets us to an idea of voter turnout, especially I want all the, I'm looking at all the young people in the audience, and I really want you to cement this in your knowledge, in your mind. I also want to talk about race in this. These numbers right here represent the people that are ineligible to vote in those states because of felony conviction, okay? Many states across the country bar you from civic participation uh, after you get out of prison, when you're still on probation. Some states, like Ohio uh, and Florida, bar you for the rest of your life. And for some communities, because uh, mass incarceration disproportionately impacts men of color, uh, this is an over, then these people traditionally have voted Democratic, this is an overwhelming statistic uh, that tends to tank a, a lot of elections. So we wanna talk about Russian meddling, we wanna talk about all these things, but we're not looking internally. We need to look at a self-criticism and we specifically need to look at a situation that is enormous. We're one of the largest, we're, we're the, we have the largest prison population in the world, larger than China, larger than Russia, uh, and it disproportionately impacts men of color, yet it, is, it appears largely invisible in our, in our mass media, particularly liberal media, and it appears largely invisible in a lot of our popular conversation. Uh, the movie 13th, the documentary recently, did I think a quite good job at uh, revealing some of these, these realities. But if you look at these numbers, even you know, if you take Russian meddling or, or, or Facebook, um, fake news or anything like that, these numbers could easily overwhelm those numbers. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is, is about turnout. 
okay? It's not only about turnout, but it's also about listening to the pain and suffering of particular communities of color that are targeted and removed from voter rolls disproportionately. Greg, Greg Palast, working for The Nation and working for uh, KPFA and other uh, progressive media institutes, have done some really good research. Ar Ar Ari Berman, also for The Nation magazine, in terms of this, uh, these numbers right here. Let's continue our conversation. This is the first election since 1965 without the protection of the Voting Rights Act. As some of you may or may not know, the Voting Rights Act was gutted, at least the, the most important uh, parts of the Voting Rights Act were, were gutted in 2012, was it, by the Supreme Court? It was 11, 2011 or 2012, you can look it up. The Supreme Court um, eviscerated some of the, the protections, particularly in states uh, that were Confederate states, particularly in states that had uh, a, a long history of uh, excluding people of color from the, from the uh, uh, voting rolls. Um, the 1965 Voting Rock Rights put certain protections in for those communities and made it so that uh, if they wanted to make any change to voting procedures or policy or numbers of polling places, they had to pass it through um, the state legislature in order to do that. Uh, the Supreme Court undid quite a lot of that. So this 2016 election was the first election since 1965 without the protections of, these, um, uh, of this Voting Rights Act. According to Ari Berman, there were 868 fewer places to vote in 2016 than 2012 because of the Supreme Court decision, which disproportionately impacted poor communities, particularly rural communities, and inner city communities of color, right? Ari Berman's done some fantastic reporting on that. Write down that name if you'd like to do uh, further investigation on that. What about the people who did vote? Much has been made about the white working class vote for Trump. So I've clipped a number of headlines uh, from various different media sources, particularly liberal media sources, everything from CNN to Salon to Atlantic. Uh, the New York Times, which is the flagship liberal paper in the country, ran this as a headline the day after the election, right? Uh, why Trump won working class whites. Let's dig into this question. So when we look at voter data, so I gave you, I gave you state by state electoral college data. Now, I'm, I'm, now we're looking at counties that flipped, right? So we're looking at slightly more granular data. Um, so we're looking at counties that flipped, uh, meaning that voted uh, for Obama in 2012, but then turned towards Trump in 2016. These are, these are counties that flipped the other direction, so obviously they're less blue than there is red. Um, we see a, a concentration of data here, don't we? We see a pattern emerge uh, from this. We specifically see uh, no change in urban centers, places like Chicago, places like Detroit, places like Cleveland, but we see tremendous uh, flipping and what we see, what we see is what's, the, what's called the Rust Belt, right? Why do we call this the Rust Belt? And, and in fact, when I moved to Ohio, I actually didn't know what the term Rust Belt meant. Um, so these are traditionally uh, manufactured in industrial states that employed an, an, an incredible number of people in both uh, automotive industry, uh, parts manufacturing, and steel industry. It's called the Rust Belt because quite a lot of those factories are now rusting out. Um, there were two waves of offshoring of jobs, first in the late 70s and then in the late 90s. Uh, in the late 70s, um, you saw an enormous uh, uh, pattern of particularly African American workers being laid off. Last hired, first hired, or sorry, last hired, first fired situation because of union seniority and because the, the, the gains in the civil rights movement had just gotten them into quite a lot of those factory jobs. They were some of the first fired in those uh, factory downsizing and offshoring, okay? So this also clues us into another issue of the pain of poor and black communities and brown communities. If we are not listening to this pain, we're not listening to the tragedy of this deindustrialization because that second wave of deindustrialization in the late 90s, predominantly due to NAFTA and other free trade agreements passed by Democrats, particularly Bill Clinton, uh, ushered in an, an, an enormous uh, uh, large wave that, that, that 
overwhelmingly impacted uh, white working class people, particularly in states like Michigan and Ohio. So the people that were remaining in the auto industry, the people that were remaining in the steel industry, places like Youngstown, places like Gary, Indiana, they received uh, uh, pink slips and layoff notices due to factories closing in the late 90s. So there's a relationship, I'm arguing, between these two things. And uh, what we've seen in, in a lot of um, uh, American history is these tragedies impact black communities first, and then shortly after that, if, if not immediately after that, or within a few decades, start dramatically impacting white communities. But there is a disconnect, right? There's not, a there's not a relationship often formed in our dialogue in the journalism or in quite a lot of our academic conversation as well. So this gives you some more granular data. Let's keep, let's keep digging into this question of the white working class. So, men and women, now we're looking at uh, whites with no college degree. So the biggest gains made in 2016 were whites with no college degree. For those that have studied um, working class discourse in the United States, that's generally how they measure the white working class. Uh, white people with no college degree. They, had don't, they don't have an accurate way of measuring this. In the United States, the United States is a country that loves to not talk about class for a whole variety of reasons we can talk about in the, uh, in the questions and answers. So that's their default mechanism for judging this number. Uh, and as you can see, that number jumped considerably between 2004 and 2016. Another tragic uh, piece of information you can gain from this graph is that the tremendous outpouring of support of women towards Hillary Clinton happened but did not happen at the number that they s assumed that would happen, uh, particularly among white women. Something like 52% of white women uh, voted for Trump, uh, even though uh, quite a lot of um, misogynistic comments, quite a lot of um, energy and, sp and, and, and criticism came about. There was not, you know, so we barely lost ground with women. That's been a, a very interesting thing that we need to kind of dig into as well uh, as a country and as a, as, a, as a college. Do liberal commentators get the argument about the white working cl class voter right? I'm going to say that there's two converging liberal myths. One, that the white working class is stupid and votes against its interests. I'm putting stupid in, in quotation marks there. Or that they are a natural and inevitable constituency of the Republican Party, therefore Democrats shouldn't waste energy on appealing to them. This has been a, an argument within the Democratic Party since at least the 70s, right? Since at least Nixon's campaign in 1972 um, in his campaign to try to, to realign and break apart the New Deal coalition. Uh, for older uh, audience members here, uh, this is probably a, a more puzzling question. If you were a working class person, especially if you were a union member, most of the 20th century, you voted Democrat, right? There was Franklin Delano Roosevelt put together something called the New Deal Coalition, and it held power for 50 or more years, from 1933 to the late 60s, right? So this, this phenomenon within the last uh, 30 to 40 years of white working class people breaking off from the Democratic Party coalition and voting Republican is an anomaly. For younger people, you're like, yeah, that's what happens, right? But, we need, but rather than kind of shrugging our shoulders and saying, yeah, that's what happens, we need to dig into what are some of the causal factors here. Okay, so the other liberal myth is that the Republican Party is an unwitting beneficiary of a, what's called a white backlash. Van Jones uh, made that comment in, in uh, CNN on the day of the election. Uh, they do not need to work hard to organize those votes. I'm going to argue that both of those are, are incorrect. What does this narrative do, this, this liberal myth? It conveniently lets the Democratic Party off the hook from any self-criticism of what they are not doing to attract working class voters. And it does not ask what they are, are doing to close the enthusiasm gap, the 94 million people who did not vote at all. Okay, what does, this what does this narrative miss or actively cover over? The fact that since the 1980s, the Democratic Party has, has not actively pursued policies that would attract working class base. Or to put it in Thomas Frank's words, quote, how did the party of the people become the party of the affluent suburbs, or even worse, the party of big finance? Equally, it misses a long the long-term project by the Republican Party to attract these same voters, as I said, since Nixon. 
Lastly, it misses the real pain experienced by countless working class voters from neoliberal policies developed and implemented by Democrats. This is a part of the conversation we missed too, such as NAFTA under Bill Clinton, welfare reform under Bill Clinton, spiraling student debt crisis, at least for the last 30 years, increasing mass incarceration, all of which produces a downwardly mobile, disillusioned and frustrated group of people who were raised in a culture of white supremacy to believe that the world belonged to them. Right, so we have two countervailing trend, you know, movements here. One, raised in white supremacy, thinking that the world belongs to you, yet you are downwardly mobile. Your jobs are, are going overseas, your factories are closing. Quite a lot of um, demographic change in, in, in qu throughout the country uh, and quite a lot of um, disillusionment and, and um, disaffectedness, right, happening within the society. How do we measure this, right? What is, it, what, is a, what is a metric by which we can look at this phenomenon? So when you have people that are, that are in that schism between a world that they think should exist based upon all of the, 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 uh, the balloon being blown up, what happens when that balloon pops, right? What, what happens when that reality starts to, to crumble in a lot of ways? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at one statistic that I think is quite uh, interesting and, and doesn't get discussed very much. Uh, mortality rate among middle-aged people, right? So across the world, uh, the mortality rate uh, is going down, right? But in the United States, particularly among one group, the mortality rate is going up, and up pretty dramatically, actually. So, and this is shocking to me. African Americans, the mortality rate has gone down, actually substantially down. Uh, in, in, in the last, uh, since 1999. However, and the white population overall is, is gone up, but only slightly. Mainly people with college degrees, it's either flat or going down. It's the people with no college degree. This is where we see uh, the largest uh, public health crisis. And what are some of the causal factors do you think about that contribute to this uh, increased mortality among middle-aged uh, 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 white people, particularly white men. Drugs and alcohol, Drugs and alcohol. absolutely. Princeton economist did a, a study uh, called uh, morbidity, morbidity and Mortality in the 21st Century, and that was their overwhelming conclusion. And it's an, an issue that, does, that impacts this county as well. There's quite a heroin and Oxycontin problem. Here, the, you know, there's about four overdoses a month. It's been reported uh, widely in the Press Democrat and the Bohemian. So it's across the country. We're talking about some, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 80,000 deaths a year, right? So these are what they're calling diseases of despair, okay? So let's put this down in our notes, the diseases of despair, right? So this starts to get at some of that schism that I'm talking about, these countervailing trends, right? Um, that are happening within these votes. And when you look, so let this, this gives you the data across uh, the, um, the industrial, so the G8. It gives you the, 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 the numbers across France, Germany, UK, Canada, so on and so forth. I mean, these are plummeting, right? And yet, uh, the United States is rising, particularly suicide, uh, drug, alcohol, and suicide mortality, right? Wow, 50 to 54. That is an alarming statistic. Now, using regression analysis, statisticians have uh, overlaid where there is high rates of uh, mortality among uh, middle-aged uh, white population. And interestingly enough, they argue that it lays it precisely over the counties that flipped from 2012 to 2016 using regression analysis. This is the, the also, also these Princeton uh, in morbidi morbidity and mortality in the 21st century in that report. So that is, I, I think, an alarming uh, set of data. It's not necessarily a causal argument, but it is an argument that n bears more research and bears um, more analysis. So I'm putting it out there as something that is, uh, it's, re it's, it's relational but not causal, but it is interesting and allows us to paint a qualitative story, right, from the data that we're looking at. I don't think that's my argument here. So, but let, uh, I'm gonna let me answer that right, right, right in, the, in the question and answer period, absolutely. Um, so 
what's been the trend, as I said, within the last 30 years in the Democratic Party, at least since the 80s? Thomas Edsel is one of the nation's most uh, important academic voices in studying uh, working class issues. He writes for the, uh, the New York Times. He wrote in a very important academic book in the 90s called Chain Reaction. What does he say about the Obama coalition? All pretenses to trying to win a majority of the white working class has effectively been jettisoned by the Democratic Party in favor of cementing a left-center coalition made up on the one hand of voters who have gotten ahead on the basis of educational attainment, professors, artists, designers, editors, human resource managers, lawyers, librarians, social workers, teachers, and therapists, and second, substantial constituency of lower income voters who are disproportionately African American and Hispanic. They do this despite the fact that the white working class voter still comprises a slight majority of the overall eligible electorate, 51% down from 71% in 1980. These are wonderful researchers on this subject, if you're interested, copy down their names, particularly his name. Okay. Now, I've given you an academic analysis, but let's hear it from Democratic Party leaders themselves. Uh, during the 2006 election, Democratic Party leader Chuck uh, Schumer, uh, New York, infamously declared for every blue-collar Democrat we lose in Western Pennsylvania, we will pick up two moderate Republicans in the suburbs of Philadelphia, and you can repeat that in Ohio, Illinois, and Wisconsin, the exact states that they lost, right? That shifted the, the election uh, in the opposite direction. Uh, Rob Emanuel makes a similar argument. Rob Emanuel was Obama's chief of staff, uh, and he's currently the mayor of Chicago. The future of presidential election, a, a statewide election or a congressional, is in the suburbs where more moderate voters exist. So they're putting their efforts in uh, a suburban voter turnout situation. They call this the Panera Bread Strategy. I'm not making this up. This is really what they're calling it. They're calling it the Panera Bread Strategy. Um, so this is not, a, this is not a, a, an analysis of what they're doing. This is what they're actually, the Democratic Party um, uh, campaign uh, uh, officials are actually calling the strategy, uh, which the Nation magazine argues, quote, is essentially a rationale for appealing to suburban voters in swing state districts rather than spending time or money trying to s expand the Democratic Party's base among working class voters, minorities, or millennials, many of which did not turn out to vote at all, right? The 94 million people that did not vote. Uh, I don't know, any election strategy that uh, relies on consuming large amounts of empty carbohydrates is probably going to be a losing strategy, uh, just, just saying. Um. <laughs> Let me check the time. Okay, I want to zero in on a particular issue, particularly when we talk about the pain of working class voters, right, that gets ignored uh, quite substantially by the Democratic Party. This is what Tom Franks has, uh, has argued, uh, specifically when we talk about the issue of globalization, particularly when we talk about the issue of free trade. He went to, because uh, he's an extremely brave man, uh, went to uh, an, an enormous number of uh, campaign speeches that Trump did during the election. Okay. People probably know him from his book, uh, What's the Matter with Kansas? People have read this? Yeah, it's a very popular book. He wrote a book called Wrecking Crew. He wrote a book called Listen Liberal. He's been putting out a book about every two years that is trying to analyze this question that I've been trying to, 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 to dig at uh, during the course of my talk today. Um, and he's, and, and in, in analyzing Trump's campaign speeches, he said one theme constantly stood out, and that's the issue of trade. He said, in fact, to judge by how much time he spent talking about it, trade may be his single biggest concern. It seems to obsess him, the destructive free trade deals our leaders have made, you know, particularly Democratic leaders, the main the many companies that have moved their produ production facilities to other ha lands, the phone calls he will make to those companies, CEOs, in order to threaten them. Could it be that all this trade stuff is a key to understanding the Trump phenomenon? I find that to be a very provocative question, particularly when we're talking about, remember, those three states. I'm not talking about the whole country. Remember, three states flipped the election, right? And it was 77,000 votes in those three states. And the people that didn't turn out, those are, those are, the, those are the people that we're really focused in on. Um, Trump is taking on the language of the forgotten man. This was a, a, a phrase that Roosevelt used during his election um, in, in 1933, right? In his economic royalist speech, the forgotten man, right? I mean, it, it, it was so deep that people across the country put pictures of him up in their, in their houses. Bill Moyers, who's the, the famous liberal commentator on, on, on um, P. 
PBS, grew up in a poor Texas, East Texas cotton farming family, and his dad, who never had a high school degree, would tell his son, uh, Mr. Roosevelt is my friend, right? That's how deep it ran, right? But from FDR to Nixon to Trump, those are the three people in the last, uh, since 1933, that have used this phrase within their inauguration speech, right? And you see the tweet right there, just so that you know it's real. It's not real if it's not on Twitter, right? <laughs> he actually did include women in this, surprisingly. <laughs> just saying. But I think this is the importance of an intersectional ana analysis. If you read my, my, my teaser for this event, uh, I, I laid out a number of different single issue um, causal analysis that kind of explain the whole election. And I, and I made the argument that no, no, no one single causal reason is, is sufficient. And I'm gonna use trade just to try to elaborate on that point that I'm trying to make. What we need is an intersectional analysis that brings together race, class, and gender, which I've been trying to do through the course of this talk. And I'm gonna sum up by talking just about trade. Trade touches on the central fears of white identity in America. It's not only an issue of jobs, but it is about status, right? Jobs in America are about status. America, its class formation identity is not about solidarity, it's about status, which has been quite a lot of our problem throughout the country, which, which severs us. It is a divide and conquer technique that's existed all the way since slavery, right? I am not a poor worker, I am a frustrated, I'm a temporarily frustrated millionaire. And, and thank God I'm not a black person, right? That's how that issue of status, or a brown person, or an undocumented person, right? This question of status, so trade gets into that status. If I'm downwardly mobile, then that balloon is not being blown up, right? I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm falling into the working class, right? Rather than that um, ascendant middle class person who's on his way or her way to being a, a, a millionaire. This is a, this is a very gendered argument too. It has to do with masculinity as well. The loss of a job is much more than the loss of economics. It's a loss of a sense of manhood, too, particularly in factory jobs that overwhelmingly employed men, right? So it's a question of, um, do I make a wage that's sufficient to keep my wife at home, right? And in fact, quite a lot of the civil rights movement was about that as well, that all those marches, I am a man, all of that stuff, was about having a certain kind of a wage that allowed them to be the patriarch, right? Uh, so trade touches into that as well. Obviously touches into national security. What's the big kind of rallying cry, build the wall, all of this, all of this different nonsense. So that question of, uh, do, is there national sovereignty? Do, do, are my borders protected? Because if my borders aren't protected, uh, terrorists could come over the borders. This, this whole terrorist under the beds kind of situation, right? That, in, in ha you know, uh, you know, you're, you're, as we've seen in the news re recently, you're much more uh, likely to be shot uh, by a domestic person uh, than it is than some sort of foreign terrorist, right? Uh, white domestic white man specifically, right? Gets into that gendered issue, right? I think you're very, I think it's, it's very perceptive too. So status, masculinity, national security gets wound together in a pretty toxic mix. In a downwardly and frustrated uh, electorate, that's easily harnessed into two things, either not voting at all because you, pe you feel that both parties are useless, which obviously a huge number of people did that, or in being mobilized by populist reactionary demagogues, right? And unfortunately, that is, there's a long history of that. All th you know, I mean, this is a, the, the example of Hitler, then this is me tying into uh, Marco's speech just a few weeks ago about the rise of fascism, right? But a lot of this frustration comes from policies that were implemented by the Democratic Party. We can't lose sight of that. And this is, I'm tying into the talk that Terry gave about neoliberal education reform. Quite a lot of this frustration uh, is not uh, blind and it's not stupid either, right? These are not stupid people. They, you can get mobilized in a, in a, in a, in a wrong-headed direction, but to have hope for the future, that, that the reality you're living in right now is bleak and desperate and you want something better, that's something we can talk to people about. I refuse to talk to, to uh, openly convinced and avowed racists, but I think that number is actually pretty small. I think most racism is pretty, pretty teaspoon deep. And I'm interested in talking to those people. And I think we as progressive-minded people need to be interested in talking to those people as well. So what I've tried to lay out to you is both a kind of quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis that focuses on, on race, 
quite a lot of people that get excluded from the vote, and an enthusiasm gap, quite a lot of people that look at both situations, both parties and say, I don't want to vote at all, right? And tries to also do a little bit of historical analysis of where this comes from. This has all been super depressing, so let's try to end on a happy note before we get to questions and answers. A lot of my students love to look at Bernie. It makes them feel a little bit uh, happier. Uh, this coalition uh, that uh, the Bernie Sanders movement has put together is quite interesting to look at. Um, they're looking at demographics as being in the favor of progressive voting. I think the election in, in, in Virginia recently, and in Philadelphia, and in Minnesota, and in Montana just, just two weeks ago, shows us some of these coalitions that are coming together as part of this resistance to try to um, elect progressive candidates, transgender candidates, candidates that have long track records of defending Black Lives Matter. matter. Uh, uh, refugee candidates in Montana. I gotta go to this town in Montana. This seems incredible, right? Um, but I think we should not put all of our hopes in one uh, man, as interesting as he might be. We also need to put our hopes in the people that are getting trained in Black Lives Matter, people that are c in the undocumented student movement, people that are in the $15 minimum wage and unionization movement, and all the women that came out across cities all across the country to try to reject misogyny and patriarchy. And I think the most important question you need to ask yourself is who's next? And why isn't it you? Thank you very much. Okay, so we have about 20 minutes for questions and answers. I can't see because of the lights. Yes, go ahead. Well, I mean, that's an interesting question. I think that if you look at the coalition that, uh, that Trump's put together, it is, it is older and, and white. Um, and so th in a certain way, that, that tries to tell you about the desperation of that. I mean, so it's become increasingly shrill and increasingly desperate because there's demographic realities that work against them. You know, so I say that, I mean, so everybody's like, oh, thank God, there's some good news. However, there's some counter failing trends within millennials that suggest that there are also, you know, that, that not all, you know, some millennials are one to this alt-right movement. Uh, we see this in, in recent kind of demonstrations across the country. There's a kind of growing neo-Nazi movement among young people, yeah. Right. It's actually very small, and it's mobilized 21% of the electorate through the way he's seeking to explore. But uh, I think the, the people behind that, the Koch brothers of right. the world, recognize that, and um, they. this is why Trump is an authoritarian. Right. They, they're not going to work. It's not going to win in a democratic system. It's going to come down to, can these people seize our system and, and abolish, you know, whatever... Uh, realistic or, or real uh, democratic um, authority that the people have. Uh, I don't know if I'm making sense. No, I think you're right. That, that this current Republican president is an authoritarian and is really hostile to the constitutional order because he's really, really outnumbered. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's, it's dramatically unpopular. That's why, that's why the numbers, I think, should give us some reassurance. I mean, it's depressing to see how many people didn't vote, but those are all people we can mobilize, right? Uh, so, I mean, to answer both of your questions is the future is determined on what we do in the present, right? Organize, 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 right? I mean, that's the key to this whole thing because, you know, I mean, that's how the neo-Nazis are, are rising. They're organizing, right? We will never win what we don't fight for, right? And the Democratic Party has not fought for these voters. Uh, and in fact, in pl put in place policies that, ac that actively make their lives more miserable, right? Um, and so... We need to, to the degree that we can, um, as quite a lot of this uh, Bernie Sanders movement is trying to do, there's a progressive winner of the party that's trying to take over these various different uh, statewide parties, countywide uh, meetings, even campus-wide meetings, right? Uh, some pe I, and I admire the people that are doing this. I mean, I've, I kind of believe what Alexander Coburn said about the Democratic Party. Um, it's like a black hole. Energy goes into it but never comes out. Um, but... 
a different, I mean, I was mobilized to, uh, to campaign for, for Obama in, in Ohio, which was a, that was a hard fought battleground state, right? That only won by something like 300,000 votes the year that we won, right? So, please. I th I, well, I think especially when you, when you talk about white women, I think in those states that I'm talking about, the population of African-American Latinos is not very big compared to Texas or California. I mean, where the we have an enormous african it, it's uh, but but it's still I mean it's probably somewhere around because of the the uh, the way that felony conviction rules work it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of three percent four percent of the vote um, which is significant but not to the degree of, of the numbers of white working class but I think you're I think you're absolutely right I mean I, I mean I think and I, and I think to the degree that we can overturn some of those felony conviction rules that that purge people from the from the from the voting rolls I think the, the degree that we can help uh, bring into being more vo more polling places and, and a more convenient time to vote is the degree that we can so those are tangible reforms that can directly impact that to go to the question about white women that's a dramatic question and I think that that bears a lot of exploration and that wasn't the that wasn't the thrust of my of my talk today but I, th I think that is a very significant issue particularly in the face of such out in your face misogyny I think that my only my only response to that um, is that the misogyny that we saw, I think, I think what we're seeing with the Me Too campaign is that w women face a lot of misogyny in their everyday life, and it can sometimes become invisible. Unfortunately, I mean, that's, that's my only way of thinking about it, but I, I think much more analysis needs to be done why there wasn't a bigger explosion of, of, of uh, female votes for uh, Hillary Clinton. I think, I, think that's, I think that's a very, very, very fair question. Because they do make an overwhelming percentage of the, of the electorate in most states, right? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Eight hundred and sixty eight. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's right. 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 So I think this is, but this is on us to to pass this at our state legislatures and 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 you know a whole variety. So this is us getting involved in the county uh, process and the state process in order to you know the basically the board of elections. I mean, when you walk into the to the polling place, what do you see? Who are the poll workers usually? And elderly, yeah. I mean, so I mean they pay you something like twelve dollars that whole day to do to do that job. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty you know difficult to do unless you're retired. So I think that, but but th there's no reason why we couldn't be involved in that, right? I mean, especially students that are interested in in the process and political science and these kind of things. So we need to kind of mobilize. I mean, this was a wake up call in many ways. I think you're exactly right. Uh, but I I want to see a, ca a candidate that says, you know. This is my part of my platform, this electoral reform, right? This campaign finance reform, electoral reform. I think that's key to us uh, winning that future. I think you're right. I mean, I think there is a reason why there is a, a, a very low number of turnout in many uh, minority communities, right? One, outright being barred from voting, felony conviction, or just making it incredibly hard. I think you're right. You had a hand up earlier, sorry. I was just curious about the turnout. Absolutely. Yeah. Why, why can't, I mean, obviously it can, but why 
this is something that a true third party yeah. can violate. Right. That can actually bring people to court. So I, I'm looking at right now, I saw one of my mentors during my dissertation was Corey Robbins and, uh, over at uh, Brooklyn College, political scientist. And he's arguing that we might be entering in a phase in which there might be four parties uh, emerging. So there might be a split within the Republican Party and a split within the Democratic Party. This hasn't happened since before the Civil War. So there is some history of it. This happened around the turn of the century as well with, the, uh, with um, Teddy Roosevelt. So we might be interest in entering an interesting time. However, those two splits uh, might create further polarization as well. Um, so it would be something that we'd have to be very, very vigilant about. Um, I, I see people, I mean, you know, I, I voted third party myself, to be honest. Um, I don't hate me afterwards. Don't come and, don't come and find me. But... Um, uh, but so that that's my direction. But that's uh, that's after enormous decades of frustration with the Democratic Party, right? Where I've kind of gone back and forth. Yeah. Well, one question for you is, um, you've been always been an evangelical for the church. Yeah. And given all those investigations. Yeah. Given revisiting Watergate. Yeah. What would it take to to um, impeach this guy? <laughs> Well, I think just let them keep talking. I mean, <laughs> that's number one. I mean, I think we've seen some uh, Republicans break off from the coalition, Flake, McCain, Corker, um, and really, I mean, Flake wrote a whole book, right, uh, criticizing this kind of Trump takeover of the party. Uh, I, I don't put a lot of faith in these people, but basically to, for impeachment to happen, Republicans would have to vote for impeachment. I don't put a lot of faith in them, but they're very angry right now, and they're very angry at the identity of their party changing. So they could either form a, a, th a third party movement, a conservative third party, uh, or they could try to vote for impeachment. I un unfortunately don't see it happening. I mean, what is it gonna take for this to change for 94 million people to vote, <laughs> right? That for, 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 for turnout, yeah. I, I, you know, I mean, unfortunately, I don't think so. I was in high school during Bill Clinton's first uh, election, and I was uh, very mobilized by that in 1992. Uh, but that was on my own, and because I came from a family, but it was not taught in my high school. I think California does have a progressive motor voter law. So a lot of people do that, get a driver's license, can register to vote with a check of a box. But just because you're registered doesn't mean you go vote, right? I mean, that's the problem. Yeah. What about high school Well, it's been eviscerated, right, for the last you know, 20, 30 years, right? So, I mean, it's, it's very limited, right? So this whole, uh, you know, uh, No Child Left Behind and, and, and some of the Race to the Top stuff is, has really eviscerated quite a lot of that uh, democratic education. So I think that's another concrete, tangible thing we can fight to get back. Much like we can be involved in county boards of elections, every school has a school board, right? Where, you know, quite a lot of, and then people can work their way from the school board to the state level in the school board. This is super boring stuff. In fact, I often say their biggest weapon against us is an ultra boring meeting. Uh, I mean, Robert's rules of like complete want to, you know, jump off the building, right? Um, but it's all possible and you can learn it, right? And you can, I mean, it's, it's, if a bunch of young people entered into uh, a local county uh, space, th they'll Oh my God! Right? I mean, they'll 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 really freak out, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's a trend since Nixon, right? I mean, and even before Goldwater. Um, I mean, so this idea that the country's being run by kind of pinheaded liberals, egghead liberals, right? Uh, William Buckley is kind of the, one of the fathers of the modern conservative movement in his magazine, National Review. Famously said in the 50s that he'd rather be led by the first 300 people in the phone book in Boston than any professor at Harvard, right? So, you know, I mean, I think this, this has been a long, ongoing, you know, kind of anti-intellectual campaign. Um, but I think, I think the swing the other way is, is a problem, too, the way the Democrats rely on technocrats, right? You know, kind of hyper-smart, you know, financial speculator types and, and these type of dot-com whiz kids because there's a problem in that re arena too, right? I mean, it's particularly with sexism and, and, and other such problems. But So I think that we need to find some sort of 
um, left-wing populist movement that has at its base a kind of alliance of um, intellectuals and, and other such people. I think we need to more broadly define the term intellectual to include you know, all kinds of different people that, that, uh, that, that uh, can affect this process in an intelligent way, yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Uh, well, yeah. yeah. The mega churches, yeah. So let me, let me give you a per just a very quick personal story. When I moved to Ohio, um, this is what I saw. I saw boarded up uh, factories. I saw, you know, uh, derelict main streets. I saw just a tremendous amount of depression and alcohol and drug abuse, except for when you went down the street to the megachurch. That was a very vibrant space. But this is a major question for the left, right? In the 1930s and 1940s, the left would have recruited those people into union campaigns, into various different progressive caucuses and reform-minded uh, campaigns. Right now, the left is absent in those spaces. So who fills in those spaces? The churches. If you're in Ohio, the only place you can get drug rehabilitation services is at those churches. The only place you can often get a food bank is at those churches. I mean, that's kind of the truth in this community too. If you're homeless, where are you going, right? So, you know, these spaces get taken over by the, by the retreat of the left, right? So, I mean, I think that's a, and, and by a retreat of progressive religious people. Um, of which there is a lot, right? So I mean, I think that there's a lot of movement that needs to be done. Let me just say one last thing. Why in the world would religious people vote for Trump? I mean, that's a really good question, particularly if you're evangelical. Supreme Court nominations. I think that that's the big answer to that question, yeah. Yeah, community college, yeah. I think there was no, in education policy, there was no light between uh, George W. Bush and, and Obama. I thought, I thought Arne Duncan, there was no light. There was, there was light between a lot of different policies, but in terms of war, in terms of deportation, or in terms of education, there was very little light between the, the gap. I think that that's, uh, I mean, so we can impact gerrymandering too. It gets redrawn every 10 years. So we, one, we have to be aware it exists. So this is the redesigning of, of voter districts to where it makes people very safe in their district. And so and they're called gerrymandering because it's like, you know, they, they, they carve it out in such a way that it, that it protects affluent communities in, in a particular voting district. Um, so I think turnout. I mean, what I, what I, the only way to overcome any, of, any one of these things that we're talking about is overwhelming turnout. I mean, if we can turn people out, uh, then we can win. I mean, I think our Board of Trustees election is a good example. I mean, we've, we've had a major uh, turnover. I mean, people that have been trustees for 20 plus years were re recently voted out, uh, mainly because of turnout. What did they do? They went, you know, Mariana and some of the others, that, uh, Jordan. Uh, Dorothy, they went and knocked doors that had never been knocked before for trustee elections, right? They went to Roseland, they went to communities that never get paid attention to, especially on those down ticket elections. And what happened? They won, right? And the composition of our board of trustees has dramatically changed because of that. The project labor agreement is one example of, of many uh, in which we can see some 
some forward movement in terms of a progressive agenda. So we can win, folks. I don't want this to be a depressing uh, scenario here, but we need to organize. We need to be involved in, in, the, in the boring minutia, right? We need to, we need to uh, make, uh, make our students enthusiastic, knowledgeable and enthusiastic about the process, which means that we, be, we need to be involved as well. Uh, and we can win. We gotta be animated by a vision of the future uh, that is better than the present because that is what Ameri particularly Americans want to see, right? Um, you know, so we can't have a boring technocratic view vision of the future. As we've seen in the last election, that does not mobilize voters, right? We need to have a vibrant, uh, multicultural, multiracial, anti-sexist, anti-racist uh, vision of the future. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. I mean, I, so 16.6% of the, the eligible electorate in California is uh, undocumented um, and so not able to vote. Um, what's interesting is quite a lot of my undocumented students are more involved in this, these processes that I'm talking about than quite a lot of my, my natural born citizen students. Um, and that talks to you about, they understand the consequences and the costs of not being involved, I think, to a great degree. But I think that that, I think the demographics, the writing's on the wall in terms of changing demographics against a certain kind of, uh, well, to flip on the Republican National Convention, look at that picture <laughs> and, look at, uh, and look at pictures of, of what, what the country looks like. Uh, even in places that you might be surprised to look at, right? Even in, in, uh, in, in quite a lot of um, in non-urban areas within the country because of people moving jobs, because of you know, the, the expense of living in, in Chicago or Los Angeles has pushed people into areas where they have not normally congregated, right? So I think the future is quite different, but it's all about turnout and it's about mobilization. Educate, agitate, organize. Okay, it's going to be have to be it for today. We're, it's we're at one o'clock. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> <laughs>